Uh, hey, we have a guest speaker with us today. I am super excited. I'm not going to take a long time introducing him, um, but Micah Mack, Pastor Micah Mack is with us. Now, you may or may not know this, but our students went to Momentum Youth Convention this past week, and uh, yes, um, and I heard, I heard we had, uh, depending on how you count it, four or six different students who expressed a call to, was it missions in particular? Uh, missions in particular. So that is incredible that the Lord is speaking to the, to the hearts and lives of our kids. God's doing a great work. But one of the benefits of one of our former staff working at our district office is that when we have convention and we have guest speakers come in who are high caliber, um, then uh, Pastor Chris calls me and says, hey, uh, I would like to book a Sunday service for Pastor Micah Mack. Can you have him in? And I say, yes, absolutely. So uh, with that said, um, uh, Pastor Micah is a, a communicator, travels all around. He does a lot of youth work, but uh, speaks in uh, a variety of different contexts. And I've heard incredible things about this past weekend. I know he's got a word for us today. So would you welcome Pastor Micah Mack as he comes to share God's word with us this morning? Good morning, Illinois. It's good to be with you guys. Can we give it up for the leadership of this church and your pastor and his family and the leadership that's here? It's amazing. And uh, it's great to be in the state of Illinois. And uh, to get things started, it's in the morning. I'm still trying to wake up. The students from Momentum are still trying to wake up. Can we just do something together? We're going to do a little exercise together. Now I, I, now, I need you to, I need everybody in the room to participate with this, okay? No one with their arms crossed. I need everybody to participate. So I need everybody to stick your hands out to the side like this. This is going to be amazing. Students, you've done this. You let everybody stick your hands out like this. And on the count of three, I want you to clap above your head. Okay, one, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Congratulations, as you are all Minnesota Vikings fans. Congratulations. So glad uh, you guys can join the Minnesota club. We are from Minnesota, and if you have no idea what you just did, when the Vikings score a touchdown, the whole stadium does the skull clap above their head to cheer on our Minnesota team. And so... Uh, sorry if I just lost all credibility with you, and you're like, I'm done listening to this guy. He just made me be a vi We're done, okay? Give me a chance. Um, but my name is Micah, and I brought my wife with me today, Steph. In fact, I uh, brought a picture of my wife here. That's Steph. And uh, we met in a university called North Central University in downtown Minneapolis. It's an amazing school there, and we both met there. We graduated from there. And it was probably the best thing that ever happened to my life, other than Jesus, was God allowing me to meet Steph. And uh, we travel the country, preaching anywhere and everywhere that God opens up a door. In fact, uh, there was a young evangelist by the name of Billy Graham. And Billy Graham, when he started his ministry, he said, God, I'll go wherever you want me to go, and God, I'll be whoever you want me to be. And when I heard that in his documentary, when he passed away, I stole that and I started praying, God will go wherever you want me to go. God will be whoever it is you want me to be. And uh, we were in the local church as full-time youth pastors up in Minnesota at a church called Cedar Valley. Felt like God told us to go. And so we've been on a ministry of faith, a ministry journey of just praying and fasting and saying, God, would you open up the doors we're meant to go into and preach the gospel and within the last two years, we've been doing this for two years, we've seen over 6,000 young people, students, give their life to Christ and say, I want to follow Jesus. And that's what it's about. It's about being obedient. And if there's one thing I've learned, when it comes to following Jesus, he never looks at age. He never looks at resume. He just looks at people who say, God, here I am. However you want to use me, I'm available. That's what he looks at. In fact, I find it ironic that when the angel shows up and tells Zechariah that he's going to give birth to a baby, Zechariah doesn't believe him. He's in his age of about 80, and I probably wouldn't believe it either, but he, his mouth was shut for nine months. And then the angel visits a little girl by the name of Mary at about the age of 13, and she says, Lord, here I am, your servant. God looks for humility, and he looks for the people that will say, God, here I am, send me. It doesn't matter how old you are in the room. If you still have breath in your lungs, God has a plan for your life, and he desires to speak through you, to, to walk with you, to walk a step with you. And so uh, my wife and I, we've been on this journey. 
And uh, we do have children. You can put up a picture of my daughter. That's Everly there uh, when she was born. And my wife looked at me one day. You can leave that picture up. And she goes, hey, Micah, I left some clothes out uh, for Everly. Would you mind dressing our daughter and getting her ready for church? And I'm thinking to myself, like, how hard is it to dress a baby? It's really not rocket science. So I put on Everly's clothes and I brought her to church. And when I walked in the building, these group of moms were standing in the lobby and they noticed my daughter and they come up to me and they go, Micah, did you, did you dress your, your baby this morning? I said, well, I sure did. Isn't she beautiful? I mean, she looks adorable, doesn't she? And a mom pulls me aside and she goes, Micah, I just need to let you know that when you dress your baby first, what you want to do is you want to put on the onesie first and then you put on the pants. Okay, Micah? And I'm like, I didn't think this was rocket science. Like, I'm a man, okay? Like, in the morning, I put on my pants, and then I put on my shirt. Like, how hard is it to dress a baby? Supposedly, there's ways of dressing babies. And if you're a guy in the audience today, and you showed up and looked at that picture and saw nothing wrong with it, I'm with you, okay? We're in the same boat, all right? I'm trying to figure, to me, it's like there's clothes, they're dressed, what's, what, what else is there to do, you know? So... I'm still learning this whole dad thing and this whole father thing and what it means. But this is a picture of Everly now. You can put up the next picture. She's three years old, and she is a gem. She is a spitfire. She's passionate. Uh, man, it's so fun to have kids and be able to travel with them on the road. And so we travel a lot together, and she's used to airplanes and airports and hotels. And uh, it's been amazing to be able to have her on the journey. In fact, right when she got into your nursery, she immediately picked up one of those rocking horses, brought it to a spot, and just started rocking. And so um, it's fun to be able to do the journey together. And then we have a son. You can put up the next picture. This is my son, Malachi. And uh, he looks a lot like his mom, which, thank the Lord, he's got his mom's looks. Uh, but he has these bright blue eyes, and he's one. And uh, it's fun, fun to be able to have them on the journey. Uh, today's message is titled, uh, From Death to Life. It's today's message and the title of today's message. And my prayer is that today God would speak to you in such a way that it lines up with his word, but it inspires you, it motivates you, it corrects you. And to start off today's message, I wanted to share a story of a couple of siblings who grew up together. And it was your typical sibling rivalry. And it was a brother and two sisters. And growing up, I have three sisters, and I didn't have any brothers. I'm the oldest in my family. I have three younger sisters, and so, but it was your typical sibling dynamic, and they, you know, pick on each other, and times where they don't get along with one another, but there was a shift that happened in this sibling dynamic, and it was this moment when this brother and these two sisters ended up having an encounter with Jesus when they met Christ, and if they could be here today to share the story with you and describe When was the moment in your life that everything changed? They would describe to you a moment when Jesus met them and they met Jesus. And it wasn't just a relationship that was a historical one that you heard from a Bible, but it was a relationship that was an everyday relationship with Jesus. And they uh, did life with Jesus. They did life with one another. And now their siblings, as they grew older, they became Uh, best friends with one another. They encouraged one another. They challenged each other to love Jesus more. They encouraged each other. They prayed for one another. And it was a beautiful dynamic watching this brother and two sisters begin to grow together in Christ. And if you have siblings in the room today, some of you may know what it's like to see your family grow in Christ and how rewarding it can be and how rich it can be. Not perfect, not easy but rewarding and beautiful. But there was something that happened with the brother, and as the brother got older, he began to get sick, and his sisters would encourage him, hey, you should really go to the doctor and get checked out. And the brother, you know, didn't really like doctors. I know I'm fine. It's okay. I'll just sleep it off. And kind of had a stubborn side to him. No, I don't really need to go to the doctor. I'll be all right. But the condition this brother had got worse, and As he got older, it began to get worse, and the sister says, you really need to go to the doctor. So he went to the doctor to go get an exam to find out what was going on with his body, and after the doctor ran some preliminary tests, did some blood work and different things like that, the doctor came back in the room, sat the man down and said, "Um, son, do you have family? And he goes, yeah, I have family, but why does that matter to why I'm here? 
why does it matter if I have family? He goes, son, I'm going to give you some news. I'm going to show you the results of what came back to us. And the first thing I want you to do is go home, and I want you to tell your family because you're going to need your family in your life in the days ahead. And after the doctor sat the boy down and gave him the results, he said, son, I'm sorry to tell you this, but you have a terminal disease, and you have about four months left to live. You need to get home to your family because you're going to need your family in your life. And this boy looked back at the doctor saying, okay, funny, yeah, right, like, good joke, and was in denial about it, didn't believe it. It was hard for him to believe the news. The doctor gave him some time to look over the results and just kind of be there for him. And the boy went home, and as he walked in the door, the family was in the room waiting for him, and the family sat down. He said, hey, you need to sit down. And he said, well, what's the big deal? I, I thought everything was fine. And he showed him the results, and he said, hey, I have about four months left to live is what the doctor says. And they have a terminal disease that I've been diagnosed with, and it looks like there's no way out. And after the sisters heard the brother describe his condition, the sisters, rather than responding in doubt and in fear, the sisters began to respond in faith. And this is what they started saying over their brother. Hey, you know what? I know you have this, but you know how we love Jesus and we've watched Jesus heal our friends and we've watched Jesus heal before? Well, we're not going to stop praying. We're not going to stop believing for Jesus to do a miracle in your life. And we believe that you're going to have a testimony that people are encouraged with. That if they put their faith in Jesus, the terminal disease that's been prescribed won't happen to you and you will have life in your body. And so the sisters every day began praying. Every day began crying out for their brother. A faith that was persistent. Kind of like a persistent widow who kept asking, who kept seeking, and they kept praying for their brother. And as the brother would go back to the doctor, he'd realized his condition wasn't getting better. His condition was getting worse. And then the doctor sat him down and said, son, you have probably about a week left to live. You better get the word out to extended family because you're going to want them around your bedside. In fact, we're going to move you to your own home and your own room and provide care for you so you can be around your family in your last moments. And when the sisters found out that word, it didn't discourage them. They kept believing all the more. They kept putting their faith in Jesus, kept calling out to Jesus. And as the family was around the bedside with the brother, the brother ends up taking his last and final breath he ever breathed on this earth, and the room got silent. You began to hear quivering in the room. You began to hear voices shake began to hear parents cry, uncles and aunts cry, extended family weeping. And then you had these two sisters that believed with everything that was within them that Jesus was going to show up and do a miracle just like they've seen him do before. And after the sisters had some time to process and they had some time to think about what was going on, the sisters started to say this and started to think this. Jesus, if you just would have shown up, my brother wouldn't have died. Jesus, if you just would have shown up when we asked you, when we cried out to you, when we prayed to you, when we fasted to you, Jesus, if you just would have shown up, we wouldn't have had a dead brother. And I wonder how many people in the room today can relate with that exact statement. This tension of knowing the character of God, knowing the character of who Jesus is in his word, healer, provider, caretaker, counselor, guide, leader. And I wonder how many of us in the room know the tension of God's character versus our current realities and our current circumstances. It might sound a lot like this. Jesus, if you just would have shown up, I never would have ended in divorce. Jesus, if you just would have shown up, my husband wouldn't have left me. Jesus, if you just would have shown up, we would have a job and we'd be provided for. Jesus, if you just would have shown up, we'd have been able to get pregnant and have a baby. Jesus, if you just shown up, my dad wouldn't have died. My mom wouldn't have died. Jesus, if you just would have shown up, I wouldn't have been abused. I wouldn't have been walked out on. 
and you fill in the blank with your story and what's going on. And the reality is, is if you have lived life, if you've lived life long enough, you know that tension that exists in every soul. You just would have shown up. My brother wanna die. And that is where you and I live. In fact, if you look at the story that I just told you about, all I did is took a biblical story that happened 2,000 years ago and I put it in a modern day context so you can understand the tension that exists between two sisters by the name of Mary and Martha and a brother by the name of Lazarus. It's a real tension. And Mary and Martha and Lazarus, they were all really good friends with Jesus. Like if there was anybody who knew Jesus better than anybody else, other than the disciples, it would have been Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. They were best friends. And when Jesus was sick, Mary and Martha, it says they sent word to Jesus because Jesus wasn't in the area. They sent word for him. And they say, go get Jesus because Lazarus is sick. He's probably going to die, but if Jesus shows up, we know, because we've seen it with our own eyes, our brother will live and will be healed. Go and get Jesus. And I love what Jesus does when he gets the urgent, troubling news. It says when someone sent for Jesus, they say, Lord, the one you love is sick. This is unique here because... It's describing the relationship between Jesus and Lazarus as one that he loved. When he heard this, Jesus said, this is amazing. He said, this sickness, the sickness you just told me about, it will not end in death. No, it's for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. He hears the news. Mary and Martha sent word. Jesus gets the telegram. And Jesus stops and says, no. This sickness, it's not going to end in death because it's going to be God's glory that he gets for it. And I just want to say this. Somebody needs to hear this in the room today. Not everything bad that happens in your life is because of the devil. And not everything horrible that happens to you in your circumstances is from the devil. But could it be that the very circumstances that you and I seem to walk in daily, monthly, yearly, or we're waiting for the next storm to happen. Could it be that God, if we would just sit back and trust him and take our hands off the steering wheel and take our hands off the controls of our life and we would just trust him and sit back, we would watch God get a whole lot of glory through the circumstances that you and I are walking in because God desires to get glory through you and I's life. Like our life is not about us yet so often we think it's about us and it's really easy to make it that way because when your daughter's sick when your son is ill when you have disease in your home when you have the fruits of sin living in your everyday life it can be very easy to start operating in fear and the moment fear kicks in is when you want to take over and God all the while is saying no I want to get a whole lot of glory through everything that happens in your life because you better believe I work for the good of you. I work for the good of your life. I love you as long as it's according to my purposes and my plan for your life. But so many of us quickly respond to fear, anxiety, medication, drugs, all these kinds of things. And Jesus is saying, hold up. If you would just sit back long enough, you might actually watch how I work on your good, on your behalf, if you would just continue to trust me with all your heart. Stop leaning on how you see things. Stop leaning on your own understanding of things. Trust me with all your heart. Acknowledge me in all your ways, and I will make your path straight. I will do things through your life you never thought possible. I will work on your behalf. Just trust me. Don't stop trusting on me. Keep your eyes eyes are me. And if Jesus could be here today, he might ask us this question. Where is your faith? Where is your faith? As when the disciples were in the boat and the storm was crashing over and the first words out of Jesus's mouth, other than peace, be still, he looks at his disciples and says, where is your trust? I'm right in the boat with you. I'm right in the middle of the storm. I am right smack dab in the middle of the hardship, in the middle of the circumstances. 
I am right here. No, this sickness will not end in death, but it is for my father's glory so he might get a whole lot of glory from it. And that is a hard place to hear and a hard place to be because you don't see the result of it. You're just called to trust in the middle of it. And that is a hard spot to be in. And I know for a fact in a room this size, there are people that are smack dab in the middle of it. I've heard it said like this. You are either about to go into a storm, you're currently in a storm, or you're just coming out of a storm. It's the result of us living where we're living and who we are and the concept of life. And Jesus looks at his disciples and says the sickness won't end in death. The disciples look back. And do you realize when Jesus said this, it meant this. It meant that Jesus was going to go back to the very region where he was almost stoned to death in Luke chapter 10. So for Jesus to go where Lazarus is, it means walking back and possibly dying in the very place where they tried to stone him. And you want to know who knows it? The disciples. So the disciples are bantering back and forth. And Jesus is like, we're going to go there. It's time to go right now. They went two days later. And then Thomas, I love his response. His response is like, okay, let's just go die with Jesus. Here we go. Let's go die with them. I guess it's time. We almost got stoned to death, Jesus. So Lazarus, you said it won't end in death. Well, let's follow you. We're all going to go die. Here we go. And so they're on the journey back to where Jesus was almost stoned to death. And then in verse 17, it gets really real. In verse 17, it says, on his arrival, Jesus had already found that Lazarus had been in the tomb four days. Don't forget the number four. That's really important. It said, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem. Many Jews had come to comfort Mary and Martha in the loss of their brother. Now, time out. I need to describe this really quickly to you. In America, when someone dies and we do a funeral, we might have it here at the church and do a one-hour funeral service and have different elements to the service. And then we might have a lunch, a funeral lunch, where it's apple chicken salad, croissant sandwiches with some potato chips, a pickle spear, a chocolate chip cookie, and lemonade. And then we might go to a burial if there's a burial. But how a Jewish funeral took place back in the Jewish times was this, is when someone died, family would come from all over the place, and they would wail, cry, and mourn for up to seven days straight. In other words, when someone died in the neighborhood, Everybody knew it because there was wailing, weeping, crying, and mourning for seven days straight. I think some of us can do a lot better job taking care of those who mourn or taking care of those who have lost someone. The community rallied together, and sometimes it would last for up to 30 days straight. So when it says Jews had come from all over to comfort Mary and Martha, this was normal. This is what community was like. It says, when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, this is when it gets really intense, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you would have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Martha has the audacity to look Jesus in the eye, probably rightly so, and says, Jesus, if you would have shown up, remember when we sent word for you, if you would have shown up when we wanted you to show up, our brother would have lived. What a, what a hard statement to hear when you show up on a scene. Like, what a hard, like, first thought coming out of someone's mind. Hey, you showed up now. If you would have been here, our brother wouldn't have died. Now, there could be an element of faith to that, understanding how much he heals. But it's also a statement that's saying our brother isn't alive today. and You didn't show up on time. And I love what Jesus says right back to Martha. He looks her right in the eye. The tension is thick. It's moving, Jesus. Don't forget, this was Jesus' good friend too. And it says this. He looks at her in verse 23 and says, Your brother, he will rise again. Your brother, he's going to rise again. And Jesus was speaking to something that happened in the past. Don't miss this. Jesus was addressing something that happened four days ago. And if you're taking notes, your first point is this, is Jesus, he gets the final word about your past. He gets the final word about your past. And he's addressing something that happened four days ago. It took place in the past. And he's speaking in the present to a situation that happened in the past. Martha, probably living in the past. Mary, still mourning from something of a death that happened in the past. And I just think about this. How many of us in the room always live from our past, but not our present promises in Christ? 
How many of us in the room always live in the rear view mirror looking of things that happened in our past, things that shaped us, things that defined us? How many of us today are living in the shame of our past? And it's like we're constantly focused on the rear view mirror, focusing on the sins of our past, the things of our past, the hurts of our past. And we constantly focus on that when all the while Jesus has desired to be in the driver's seat. So you don't even have an opportunity to look in the rear view mirror of your past. As if Jesus to say, you sit next to me, I'm driving this car so you can no longer look in the past. You want to know why the devil always brings up your past? The devil's always bringing up your past because he has no future. He has no future. Everything he can throw at you, all the shade he tries to get on your life, it's always going to be about your past sins. It's always going to be about your past mistakes, your past hurts, your past losses to get you to dwell on your past because the enemy is spiritually bankrupt. He has no authority. He has nothing to go off of other than your past stuff. And Jesus all the while wants to take you from your past and take you into moments and get the final word about your life. When he forgives you, your sins are removed as far as the east are from the west. When he cleanses you and washes you, he forgets the past. The past is gone. A new day has come. And when Jesus speaks over your life, you are my son, you are my daughter, you are cleansed from all unrighteousness. He means it and he gets the final word about everything that's gone on in your life. And I think about the past that I've lived and the things that I've experienced, the things that I've witnessed. You see, I grew up in a Christian home. My dad was the youth pastor. And I remember wanting to be in the youth group, but my dad said, son, you have to wait to a certain age to be in the youth group. My dad was a local firefighter. He was a, uh, uh, owned his own business. My dad was the volunteer youth pastor at a church. And I remember the youth group meeting in our downstairs basement. And I watched how they pursued God. I watched how they went after God as a young boy. And I remember saying, God, I want to be like that someday. God, I want to join the youth group someday. But before I could ever join the youth group, I watched my dad as a slow fade begin to happen. The church broke apart and didn't meet anymore. My dad stopped going to church and I began to watch a slow fade begin to take place in my home. I watched as my dad would open up his Bible in his bedroom and I'd catch him reading his Bible to now I'd open up the door in his bedroom and my dad would have hard drugs on the table. My dad bringing drugs into the home, alcohol in the home, trying to cover it up and hide it from our kids and from our lives. And I was the oldest in my family, so I saw all this going on. Then I saw my dad cheat on my mom with a different woman and not just one woman, but multiple women. And as a young man, I saw a lot of really jacked up hard things that a young man should never have to see. But unfortunately, it's a theme in our culture today of young men growing up without fathers or young men or young women growing up without a mom or the family breaking apart. I watched as the enemy got into our household, broke up a covenant that God destined for greatness between my mom and father. And I watched after 17 years of marriage, my dad walked out on our family and now I become the man of the house. And I'm thinking to myself, Jesus, if you just would have shown up, my dad wouldn't have left. Jesus, if you just would have shown up, I wouldn't have to be the man in the house. Jesus, if you... You fill in the blank. And then not only a year after that, my mom was tucking my sister in bed one night, came across a big bump in her leg. She's eight years old. Brought her to the doctor and they found out there was a six-inch by eight-inch tumor in my sister's right quadriceps. And the doctors did a biopsy on the tumor and they found out she had... 20% chance left to live, and it was stage four synovial cell sarcoma cancer. My dad just walked out of my life. A year later goes by, my sister's diagnosed with stage four cancer. Jesus, if you just would have shown up, my sister wouldn't have to have cancer. And it's like we live in this tension. And I just want to say this. If Jesus would not have shown up and found a young, hurting boy trying to be the man of the house, if Jesus wouldn't have gotten the final word about my past, if Jesus wouldn't have been a father to a fatherless boy, if Jesus wouldn't have shown up and his word minister to me and tend to me and take care of me, if Jesus had not gotten the final word about my life and who I am as a son of his, I don't know where I'd be today. And in the middle of my tension, I needed Jesus to look me in the eye and say, hey, 
It's going to be okay. Hey, lean on me. Hey, let me carry you. Hey, adhere to my word. Obey my word. Love my word. Hey, cling to me. I am only a product of God's grace and the local church of people in the church. God's people coming around a broken and hurting young boy. The best decision a single mom ever did was call a friend and say, what's the best church to bring my kids to? My mom, who had four kids, went to school full time, worked full time. I never got to see my mom very much. But Sunday, she made it a priority to show up in church and bring her kids to church. And had it not been for a church like this, had it not been for fathers in the church, men in the church, to notice me, to provide for me, to take care of me, to pay for me to go to momentum, to pay for me to go to breakaway camp. Had it not been for the local church and Jesus getting the final word about my past, I'd still be lost and broken today. But it's because of God. And his grace meeting me in my moment of weakness is because of God and his perfect timing showing up on the scene of my life and speaking into my heart, encountering him. To any single mom or single dad in the house today, I want to encourage you, don't give up. Keep going. Keep bringing your kids to church. Sometimes, if we're really honest, it feels like hell showing up to church some Sundays. Like all hell breaks loose. Like your car breaks down. Your kids are yelling. You start getting into a fight with your spouse on Sunday mornings. But isn't it funny that when you show up to church on Sunday and you leave, you think to yourself, man, I'm really glad we came today. Man, I needed to hear that today. Don't stop. Don't neglecting meeting together with one another. Don't stop going to church. Make church a priority in your home. And to all the parents and grandparents in the room, I want to empower you for one second. Your kids are not the parents of you. You are the parent of your kids. And I want to encourage you to make church a priority in showing up and gathering your family around the story of God. Do whatever you have to do. You see, Jesus not only gets the final word about your past, but point number two is you better believe Jesus, he lives in your present. He lives in your everyday life. He lives right here and right now. Jesus makes this bold statement after he talks to Martha and he says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. Whoever lives by believing in me will never die. And then he looks at Martha and says, do you believe this? Guys, do you realize the God that we serve the God that we worship, God the Father, God the Son, Jesus Christ, and God the Holy Spirit. Do you realize he is set apart and different than every other figure of religion? No one compares to the life of Jesus. Jesus is the only figure of religion to ever be congruent with the message that he preached. Jesus wasn't given a glimpse of heaven like Muhammad was. Jesus came from heaven. Jesus is visitation on earth was merely a visitation it wasn't an origination Jesus was born of a virgin Mary Jesus was perfect and sinless no one and no other figure of religion can ever compare to the life of Jesus and when he says I am the resurrection and the life he is either 100% truth telling or he is a lunatic a guy addicted to drugs but what we know about Jesus is he was congruent with the message that he preached. And he not only said, I am the resurrection and the life, but three days later after he died, he rose again. Aren't you thankful you serve a God who's alive and not dead? That we can worship him for who he is and who he says to be. We can trust in what he says. Jesus lives in your presence. Martha goes and gets Mary and tells Mary to go meet Jesus. And when Mary shows up, a beautiful encounter takes place. It says, when Mary reached the place where Jesus was in Psalm, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. The same thing Martha says in verse 33. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and trouble. Where have you laid him? He asked, come and see, Lord, they reply. Verse 35, it says, Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Don't miss this. Do you realize the God that you and I serve, 
that when he showed up on the scene and he meets Mary, Mary falls at the feet of Jesus, which, by the way, every time you see Mary in Scripture, she's always at the feet of Jesus. And she shows up on the scene, and Jesus is there. And rather than Jesus gathering all the believers and everyone in the household and saying, hey, let me give you a great speech to comfort you all. Let me say some really good words to motivate you all. It says that Jesus wept too. And know what I love about the God that we serve? is he can identify with our mourning. He can identify and weep alongside us too. If you've ever wept before, if you've ever cried before, Jesus wept too. And sometimes when we're going through difficult circumstances and we're mourning, sometimes we're not looking for people's words. We're looking for someone to cry with us too. We're looking for someone to put their arm around us too. We don't need their words. We need their presence. And Jesus is a God who lives in your presence. He comes around you. He carries you. He upholds you. He leads you beside still waters. He leads you into green pastures. He anoints your head with oil. He treats us better than our sins deserve. This is the God that comforts us, that cares for us and guides us. I remember getting the news that my dad had been in a motorcycle accident. And when I showed up to the hospital, the doctor said, hey, your dad's breathing. We'll let you go see him in a little bit. Two hours go by in the hospital. And the doctor pulls me in a separate room. He says, son, are you the oldest? I say, yeah, I'm the oldest. He goes, I'm sorry to tell you this, but we've done some research on your dad's brain and some scans. And we found out your dad's brain stem is completely crushed. And there's no brain activity whatsoever. We're going to clear the hospital room so you and your sisters can go say goodbye to your dad. And when I heard that news, it was like someone took their fist and just punched me in the gut. I lost air. Didn't expect to say goodbye to my dad on his deathbed. And I remember I left the hospital early that day because I didn't want to lose it in front of my sisters. I tried to be strong for them. So I remember going home early to my downstairs bedroom, walking through the room, going to my bed and slamming my fist on the bed and screaming and crying. The greatest loss I'd ever lost in my life up until this point as a young man. And I remember in my greatest state of brokenness, in my greatest loss in my life, in my uncontrollable weeping and crying, it was as if Jesus came in the room, put his arm around me and began to weep with me too began to comfort me, a peace I cannot describe, a peace that cannot be manufactured, a peace that surpassed all understanding. That is who Jesus is. He lives in your present. And I don't know why I can resonate with Jesus more in my brokenness, but I know scripture says a broken and a contrite heart he cannot despise. It's like he draws near to those who mourn. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. This is the condition God is wanting to bless us and to take care of us. And you better believe he lives in our present. He gets the final word about your life. He lives in your present. And your last and final point today is this. Is you better believe Jesus, he holds your future. And someone in the room needs to hear this word today. Because here's what's going on. Nobody in this text knows the future. Jesus said to Martha, your brother's going to rise again. She thought he was talking about the last days when the resurrection happens in the last days. She doesn't think right here, right now. No one knows the future. And here's what I love about this story. The final public miracle of Jesus' ministry is this miracle right here. And do you want to know what Jewish holidays right around the corner? Passover. Why is that important? Because thousands of people would be traveling outside the city into Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. When does Jesus do his final public miracle? When people would be traveling by the tombs outside the city to get into the city. Jesus saves his last miracle for the best. Remember when it says Jesus showed up four days late? Why is four days important? Here's why. It's because the Jewish community had a belief that it was possible for someone to be raised to life within three days. 
After three days, the spirit's gone. It would be impossible for a resurrection. Jesus shows up on the fourth day, not by mistake, not by accident. Jesus shows up four days late, intentionally, on purpose, to demonstrate that the impossible can always be possible with him. That his resurrection power might be seen in his fullness for people that would be passing by. And for a rabbi to speak to dead bodies in a tomb was unseen. It didn't happen. And Jesus is there. And it says in verse 38, it says, Jesus once more was deeply moved. Time out. Every time Jesus was deeply moved, he always followed it with action. I just say this to say this. God created you and I to be moved just how his son Jesus was moved. But I want to encourage you with this. Don't let the compassion that the Holy Spirit gives you to feel to be contained just to a movement. Every time you are moved, follow it up with action. Every time God puts a movement on your heart to bless your neighbor, to take care of the lady who's carrying her groceries. Every time you are moved by a kid in Africa who doesn't have anything to eat, Always follow it with an action. Always. Jesus did it time and time again. It says he was deeply moved in verse 39. He says, take away the stone. Martha, she says, but don't you know, Jesus, there's a bad odor. His body's decomposed. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? Out of all the books of the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, John uses this word believe more than any other gospel. And the point of the gospel of John was evangelistic in nature to point people to believe that the Messiah was who he was. And Jesus says, did I not tell you that if you believed in me, you would watch something amazing? Don't stop believing. Keep putting your faith in Christ for your grandson that's walked away. Keep believing in Christ for your daughter that's not living for Jesus. Keep believing in Jesus for a baby in your life. Keep believing in Jesus. Don't stop putting your faith in Jesus. Don't stop putting your trust in Jesus. Keep believing. Did I not tell you that if you would just believe in me, you would see something amazing happen? And then Jesus says a beautiful prayer. He says, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of those standing here today, that they might believe that you sent me. I love this in verse 43. It says, when he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice. I love how scripture emphasizes he used a loud voice. Because to preach to 15,000 people and no microphone, how many of you know you have? Got to be able to project without a microphone. Jesus, it says in scripture, says with a loud voice. He says, Lazarus, come out. Lazarus, come out. This is a body that's been in a tomb dead for four days. And know what I love? The same ruach. It's a Hebrew word for breath, spirit. The same breath that God used to take nothing and turn the universe into something. The same breath that said, let there be light. The same breath that said, make man in my image is the same breath that Jesus speaks over dead things and sees dead things come to life. The God we serve uses his breath, his spirit to look at dead people, dead situations, impossible realities, and through the power of his spirit allows to see dead things come to life. It's the power of his voice. No, what we need more than anything else is we don't need the opinions of others. We need the voice of God to intervene in our lives. We need the voice of God to breathe over us. We need his voice to speak into our hearts, to believe and trust in him. And then it says the dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of lemon and a cloth around his face. And then Jesus said to them, plural, take off the grave clothes and let him go. You know what I love about this story? Lazarus could have taken off his own grave clothes, but he looked at the people standing next to him to take it off for him. Jesus knew he would die and be resurrected three days later within a week or two week span from this miracle. Jesus saved his final miracle to parallel what God the Father was going to do in Jesus' life. But I love how Jesus looked at them and said, you take off his grave clothes. Because Jesus knew 50 days after his death and resurrection, something called the church would be born and be birthed 
And God was going to use the church to help take grave clothes off of people who come through these doors who are dead and need to be set free. It's possible to believe in Jesus, but still walk around in your old nature and your old grave clothes. But God has given us together as one body after his mind and heart to be really good at helping us take off the dead things in our life. It's like James says, confess your sins one to another, pray for one another, so that the grave clothes might get off of you and you might be healed and set free. I added that little last blurb in there. You take off the grave clothes, you help them, you take care of them. Y'all, this is not a perfect place. This is a hospital where a bunch of dead people are welcome. And you better believe when Jesus meets them and speaks to them and prophesies over them and his voice meets them, it's like life begins to enter in. They have a purpose and a destiny. And the church can be really good at criticizing or it can be really good at carrying. Let's be a church that's really good at carrying others and helping taking off the grave clothes and speaking life and purpose over one another, believing together, praying together together worshiping together with one heart and one mind we need you Jesus I had no idea where my future would go I didn't know what my future held all I knew is where I came from the past I've lived but I've watched God's faithfulness in my life I've watched him give me a future and a plan for my life the very house where my dad walked away from our family the very house where my dad was arrested and brought to jail the very house where my dad would stumble in drunk, the very house where all this destruction took place. My wife and I recently bought this house three years ago. And it's the house where I spend time with Jesus and pray and seek his face. And it's not a reminder of the past. It's a reminder of God's redemption and the plan he has for my life. That my kids and my grandkids will one day hear the story of God's faithfulness and how he reached a broken family and restored it for something better and something amazing. God loves to take the dead parts of your past and turn it into something beautiful for his purposes and his glory. But he would say this, don't stop believing in me. My sister who battled cancer for two years, she uh, was in a service like this and a pastor came and preached and he said, prophesied over her, said, young girl, one day you're going to come to my church in Tennessee and you're going to give a testimony on how God healed you from your cancer. We had prayed for her just how we had for two years, believing for a miracle. And the tumors had gone from her leg to her lung. She went through over 15 surgeries in her body, on her lung. She went through all the chemotherapy and all the radiation in her little body. For two years, she battled it. Make-A-Wish Foundation showed up, gave her a wish. And uh, we went to the doctor after we prayed and went to go get scans on her lungs. And when they looked at the scans, the doctor realized there were no more tumors in her body whatsoever. And God had healed my cancer, my sister's cancer for two years. She's been set free for over 15 years. She has all the scars over her body to prove it. God worked a miracle and brought this girl from death and brought her to life. I don't know where you are today or what situation you've walked in with, but God wants to take you from a place of death to a place of life to move you, to stir you, to encourage you, to keep believing and trusting in him and his plan and his ways. I want everyone just to bow their head, close their eyes, no one looking around. Prayer workers, if you can come on up and just be ready, that'd be amazing. I just want to ask somebody today where maybe you walked in the room and you feel dead. Not dead like physically, but you feel lost, you feel broken, you feel hurting. You feel absent or void of any kind of relationship with Jesus. Today I came to call you home, back into relationship with Jesus. If you're here and you're not following him or you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, I just want you right now, if that's you, say, hey, I want to surrender my life to Christ. I want him to move in my life. I want him to be the driver. I'll be the passenger. I just want you to put up your hand wherever you are. No one looking around. Just say, hey, that's me. I want to give my life to Christ. I want to surrender to him. Cool. Praise God. Anybody else? So cool. Praise God. Thank you for being honest. Jesus, I thank you for every hand raised that said, hey, I want to follow you. God, I thank you that today you are meeting them. You're speaking to them. Today, God, you're rescuing them. You're finding them. 
God, I pray for every life that's in this room, God, that they would understand the faithfulness of God and the greatness of who you are. That they would understand how awesome you are and how perfect your plan and timing is for their life. God, I pray a deepened trust over this body of believers to trust you with all their heart, to lean not on their own understanding of things, but acknowledge you in all their ways. God, I pray today would not just be inspiration. God, I pray there would be transformation. I pray healing over bodies in the room. I pray healing over relationships that are broken. Those that need forgiveness would be able to forgive. God, those who are hurting and came in broken would be set free and healed. I thank you, God, that you're that good of a God. That you're that good of a shepherd over our life. Holy Spirit, would you calm just like a moving wind over this place, a breath of your Holy Spirit to touch and minister and care, to speak to men, to soften, to heal, to convict. God, forgive us. God, forgive us for thinking so small. God, forgive us for letting us try to control our own lives. God, we repent. God, we come back to you. God, let our hearts burn for you again. God, let our hearts be moved with you again. God, we don't know the future, but we know you live with us right now, and we can trust you for the plans and future you have for us. God, we lay down every grandchild. God, we lay down every son. God, we surrender to you our spouse again. God, we surrender to you our lives again. God, would you have your way? God, would you move in this room? We thank you that you're here. If everybody in the room could stand with me today. If you notice in the front of the room, we have prayer workers today. And we're going to give you the opportunity to do one of three things. You can worship with us. You can come down and say, hey, I need prayer for something. I need a breakthrough in my life. I need healing. I need God to show up. Or you can just come forward and just pray by yourself. I want to break up some concept of prayer and getting prayer for someone. By you coming forward and getting prayer today with a prayer worker, it doesn't mean you're a jacked up, horrible person and your marriage is falling apart. I want us to get away from the stigma that people that come forward are people that are really broken. But let's be real. All of us have broken sides to us, broken fleshes to us. All of us need God. And whenever someone gives me an opportunity to get prayer, I always respond to go and get prayer. Always. Because either I need it because I know I need it, or I need prayer that I'm believing for something, a healing. Someone, my next door neighbor, I have a list of people I'm praying for breakthrough for and areas in our own life that we're praying for. So when I pray and I say amen, I want you to move this morning. Move in worship. Move in praying with someone and someone praying for you or through a situation. Move to the altar to say, God, here I am. I just want more of you. Would you take a step of faith today? Would you move today? Jesus, I thank you that you are here and your presence is here. And I pray over these next couple of songs of worship, God, we would move towards you. We would fall on our knees before you just how Mary and Martha came before you. God, we would say yes to you, whatever you're doing, however you're speaking in our, in our life. We love you, Jesus, and give you all the glory and the honor. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you worship with us? Would you move with us? We're going to worship together.